Ads heard during the podcast that are not in my voice are placed by third-party agencies outside of my control and should not imply an endorsement by Weird Darkness or myself. Stories and content in Weird Darkness can be disturbing for some listeners and is intended for mature audiences only. Parental discretion is strongly advised. Imagine this. A serial killer is on the loose, killing girls from the college you attend. The school and police both request that you walk in groups and never accept a ride from anyone you don't know, unless they have a university sticker on their car. You and a friend start walking home when a car pulls up and the driver offers you a ride. The car has a university sticker on it, so you both go ahead and get in. Unfortunately, you just got into the car with the co-ed killer. I'm Darren Marlar. And this is Weird Darkness. Welcome, weirdos. This is Weird Darkness. Here you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, crime, conspiracy, mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. If you're new here, Welcome to the podcast, and be sure to subscribe so you don't miss future episodes. If you're already a weirdo, please share the podcast with others. Doing so helps make it possible for me to keep creating episodes as often as I do. Coming up in this episode… Was Zygmunt Adamski really the victim of murderous extraterrestrial visitors? If so, why would they choose to kill a human and leave his body for all the world to see. A weirdo family member shares her hair-raising incident with an invisible phantom's hand. I just wanted to see what it felt like to kill Grandma. When I see a pretty girl walking down the street, I think two things. One part wants to be real nice and sweet, and the other part wonders what her head would look like on a stick. If I killed them, you know, they couldn't reject me as a man. It was more or less making a doll out of a human being and carrying out my fantasies with a doll, a living human doll. With a girl, there's a lot left in the girl's body without a head. Of course, the personality is gone. These are just some of the actual phrases serial killer Edmund Kemper III used to describe his joy in mutilating women. We begin with that story. Now, bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the weird darkness. Edmund Emil Kemper III was born December 18, 1948, in Burbank, California. He was the middle child and the only son born to Clarnell Elizabeth Kemper and Edmund Ampel Kemper II. His father was a World War II veteran who worked testing nuclear weapons in the Pacific Proving Grounds before returning to California, where he worked as an electrician. His wife Clarnell would often complain about her husband's menial electrician job, and Edmund later said, Suicide missions in wartime and the atomic bomb testings were nothing compared to living with her, and that his wife affected him more than 396 days and nights of fighting on the front did. Edmund was born a hefty baby, weighing 13 pounds, and by the age of four he was already standing a head taller than other children his age. He was highly intelligent, but exhibited behavior that's common among serial killers. He was cruel to animals. When he was only 10 years old, he buried the family cat alive and waited for it to die. Once he was sure it was dead, he dug it up and decapitated it, mounting its head on a spike. At age 13, he killed another family cat, believing it favored his younger sister over him. This time he kept pieces of the cat in his closet until his mother found them. His disturbing behavior didn't end there. He liked to perform rituals with his younger sister's dolls, during which he would remove their heads and hands. 
He enjoyed playing games he made up called Gas Chamber and Electric Chair, in which he would ask his younger sister to tie him up and flip an imaginary switch, and would then tumble over and writhe on the floor as though he were dying of electric shock or gas inhalation. Once his older sister asked him why he didn't try to kiss his teacher, Ed replied, if I kiss her, I'd have to kill her first. But what he didn't tell her was that at night he would sneak out of the house and go to his second-grade teacher's house to watch her through the windows, armed with his father's bayonet. Evidently, his older sister realized something just wasn't right about him, and once she tried to push him in front of a train. When that was unsuccessful, she pushed him into the deep end of a swimming pool where he nearly drowned. Ed's mother was not an easy woman to live with. She was neurotic, domineering, and an alcoholic. Some would even say she suffered an undiagnosed case of borderline personality disorder. It was no surprise when his parents separated in 1957. But unfortunately, his father, whom he was very close with, left him behind to be raised by his mother. As he grew up, his mother Clarnell would frequently humiliate and belittle Ed, as well as abuse him. She would make him sleep in a locked basement because she feared that he would harm his sisters. He was big, standing six feet four inches by the age of 15, and she labeled him a real weirdo. Any form of affection was off the table, as Clarnell thought it might turn him gay. Additionally, Ed was so much like his father that Clarnell told him that no woman would ever love him. Ed ran away from home, hoping to reconcile with his father in Van Nuys, California. As a 15-year-old boy, he was saddened to learn that his father had remarried and had a stepson. While his father allowed Ed to stay, he ultimately chose to send him to live with his paternal grandparents, as his presence made it difficult for him to enjoy his new life and new family. Ed's grandparents lived on a ranch in the mountains of North Fork, California. He hated living there, where he and his grandfather, whom he described as senile, were constantly emasculated by his grandmother. Ed got along well with his grandfather. He had even bought Ed a rifle and was learning to shoot. Often they shot birds. His grandmother didn't like it, though, and on August 27, 1964, she and Ed got into an argument at the kitchen table she told him she didn't want him shooting any more birds. He stormed away from the table and retrieved his rifle. Without skipping a beat, Ed returned to the kitchen and shot his grandmother in the head and then fired twice more into her back. He waited for his grandfather, Edmund Emil Kemper Sr., to return home from grocery shopping. He didn't even make it to the door before Ed shot him in the driveway. He didn't want to kill his grandfather, but didn't want him to suffer the loss of his wife, either. He didn't know what to do next, so he hid his grandfather's body and called his mother Clarnell. She advised him to call the police and confess. He did. Ed was arrested, and when questioned by authorities, he said he just wanted to see what it felt like to kill Grandma. He was interviewed by psychiatrists and was diagnosed as a paranoid schizophrenic, his crimes were deemed incomprehensible for a 15-year-old boy, and he was sent to the Criminally Insane Unit of Atascadero State Hospital. Ed saw numerous psychiatrists, doctors, and social workers while incarcerated. They started with the belief that he was a paranoid schizophrenic, but came to disagree with court psychiatrists' diagnosis. The reports stated that he showed no flight of ideas, no interference with thought, no expression or delusions or hallucinations, and no evidence of bizarre thinking. Additionally, he was tested and found to have an IQ of 136. Scores between 120 and 140 are considered very superior intelligence, with genius starting at 140. They changed his diagnosis, stating he had a personality trait disturbance, passive-aggressive type. Later on, during his time at Atascadero, he was given another IQ test, this time scoring 145. Ed proved to be a model prisoner and was even trained to administer psychiatric tests to other inmates. One of the psychiatrists later stated he was a very good worker and this is not typical of a sociopath. 
he really took pride in his work. He became a member of the JCs, a leadership training and civic organization for people between the ages of 18 and 40. A branch of Junior Chamber International, its areas of emphasis include business development, management skills, individual training, community service, and international connections. Members of the JCs included Bill Clinton, Bill Gates, Elvis Presley, Ronald Reagan, John Wayne Gacy, and more. Ed also developed some new tests and new scales on the Minnesota Multiphasic Personality Inventory, specifically an overt hostility scale. Ed later admitted that being able to understand how these tests functioned allowed him to not only manipulate his psychiatrists, but also to learn from the sex offenders to whom he administered tests. One thing they told him was that it was best to kill a woman after raping her to avoid leaving witnesses. Since he was a minor during the time of his first murders, Ed was eligible for parole when he turned 21. On December 18, 1969, on his 21st birthday, Ed was released. Against the recommendations of his psychiatrists at the hospital, he was released into the care of his mother, who lived at 609 Aord Street, Aptos, which was just a short drive from where she worked as an administrative assistant at the University of California, Santa Cruz. Ed stayed out of trouble and was able to prove that he was rehabilitated and his juvenile records were permanently expunged November 29, 1972. The last report from his probation, psychiatrist read, If I were to see this patient without having any history available or getting any history from him, I would think that we were dealing with a very well-adjusted young man who had initiative, intelligence, and who was free of any psychiatric illness. It is my opinion that he has made a very excellent response to the years of treatment and rehabilitation, and I would see no psychiatric reason to consider him to be of any danger to himself or to any member of society. And, since it may allow him more freedom as an adult to develop his potential, I would consider it reasonable to have a permanent expunction of his juvenile records. Ed attended community college in accordance with his parole requirements and had hopes of becoming a police officer. Unfortunately, he was rejected because of his size, which at the time of his release from Atascadero, he stood six feet nine inches tall, earning him the nickname Big Ed. Despite the rejection, he maintained relationships with the Santa Cruz police officers and even frequented a bar called The Jury Room, a popular hangout for local law enforcement officers. He kept busy, working menial jobs until he was able to secure employment with the State of California Highway Department, now known as the California Department of Transportation. The toxic nature of his relationship with his mother continued, even getting hostile at times. They had frequent arguments, so loud the neighbors would often overhear. Ed later described these arguments, "'My mother and I started right in on horrendous battles, just horrible battles, violent and vicious. I've never been in such a vicious verbal battle with anyone. I would go to fists with a man, but this was my mother and I couldn't stand the thought of my mother and I doing these things. She insisted on it, and just over stupid things. I remember one roof razor was over whether I should have my teeth cleaned." Ed saved his money, working to move out of his mother's apartment, but even when he had saved enough and moved in with a friend in Alameda, his mother was still there. She called him regularly and even paid him surprise visits. Money remained an issue for Ed, and it left him returning to his mother's apartment more than once. Then. Ed began dating a 16-year-old girl who attended Turlock High School. That same year, he was hit by a car while riding a motorcycle that he'd recently purchased. His arm was badly injured and he filed a civil suit, which he won, receiving a $15,000 settlement. He took that money and purchased a 1969 Ford Galaxy. Driving around, something he enjoyed doing, he noticed just how many young women were hitchhiking. Despite getting engaged to his young girlfriend, Ed couldn't resist storing plastic bags, knives, blankets, and handcuffs in his car. He began picking up girls and peacefully letting them go. According to Ed, he picked up around 150 hitchhikers and let them go before he felt his homicidal sexual urges, which he called his little zapples, creep up and begin to act on them. 
Ed's murder spree ran from May 1972 until April 1973. Clarnell refused to introduce her son to women attending the university where she worked. She would say, you're just like your father, you don't deserve to get to know them. But Ed didn't need his mother's permission to pick up the occasional hitchhiking co-ed. On May 7, 1972, Ed was driving in Berkeley when he picked up two 18-year-old Fresno State University students, Mary Ann Pesch and Anita Mary Luchessa. He agreed to drive them to Stanford University, and after driving for an hour, he reached a secluded wooded area near Alameda, which he was familiar with thanks to his work with the highway department. The girls hadn't even realized that he had changed directions from where they wanted to go. Intent on raping the girls and taking into account the lessons learned from the serial rapists in Atascadero, he decided to handcuff Mary Ann and locked Anita Mary in the trunk of his car. He stabbed and strangled Mary Ann before killing Anita Mary in a similar manner. During an interview, Ed confessed that while handcuffing Mary Ann, he brushed the back of his hand against one of her breasts and it embarrassed him before adding that he even said, oops, I'm sorry, or something like that, after grazing her breast, despite murdering her minutes later. He placed both bodies in the trunk of his car, and during his drive home he was stopped by a police officer for having a broken taillight. The officer had no idea what Ed had just done and suspected nothing, so he was let go. When he arrived home, his roommate was gone, so he was able to take the bodies into his bedroom where he took photos and had his way with them. When he was finished, he dismembered their bodies, placing their parts into plastic bags which he later disposed of near Loma Prieta Mountain. He hadn't disposed of their heads yet and had time to pleasure himself before dumping their heads in a ravine. Mary Ann Pesca's skull was found on Loma Prieta Mountain that August. The rest of her remains were never found, nor were any remains of Anita Mary Lucessa. On September 14, 1972, 15-year-old Aiko Ku missed her bus and decided to hitchhike to a dance class. Ed picked her up and drove to a remote area where he pulled a gun on Aiko before accidentally locking himself out of the car. Despite having had a gun pointed at her, Aiko had developed a trust in Ed and let him back inside, and it was then that Ed choked her until she was unconscious and then raped and killed her. Again, he put her body in the trunk. This time on the way home, he stopped for drinks at a nearby bar. Before heading home, he opened his trunk to admire his work. Once home, he took Aiko to his bedroom where he had his way with her and then dismembered her and disposed of her remains in the same manner he had his previous victims. Despite calling the police and posting hundreds of flyers, Aiko Ku's mother never received any information regarding the fate of her daughter. By January 1973, Ed had moved back in with his mother. On January 7th, while driving around the Cabrillo College campus, he again found a girl in need of a ride. 18-year-old Cynthia Ann Cindy Shaw was picked up and driven to a wooded area and shot with a 22 caliber pistol. He took her body home and hid her in the closet of his room overnight. Once his mother had left for work the next morning, he pulled her out and had his way with her corpse. He then removed the bullet from her body and decapitated her in his mother's bathtub. Ed kept Cindy's head for several days, regularly engaging with it, but then it was time to say goodbye and he buried her head in his mother's garden, her face pointing up toward his mother's bedroom. He later remarked that his mother always wanted people to look up to her. The remainder of Cindy's remains were tossed off a cliff. Over the course of the following weeks, all of her pieces were discovered, aside from her head and right hand. Police and a pathologist determined that she had been hacked to death, then cut into tiny pieces with a power saw. With the suspicion of a serial killer in the area, all students were advised to only get into cars with university stickers on them. Ed had one of those stickers, since his mother worked at the university. He continued to pick up hitchhikers and deliver them safely to their destinations, as he truly enjoyed driving around. But on February 5, 1973, after a heated argument with his mother, he left 
in search of a new victim. He pulled over for a couple of ladies, 23-year-old Rosalind Heather Thorpe and 20-year-old Alice Helen Allison Liu on the UCSC campus. Rosalind entered the car first, which reassured Allison. He promptly shot the girls and wrapped their bodies in blankets. He drove them back to his mother's house and beheaded them in his car. He carried their headless corpses into the house to have his way and again removed the bullets to prevent identification and then dismembered their bodies. The next morning he discarded them, and a week later some remains were found at Eden Canyon and in March more were found near Highway 1. On April 20, 1973, Clarnell, now 52, returned home late from a party. She was so noisy she awoke Ed. He got up and went to her room where she sat in bed reading a book. As soon as she noticed him, she said, I suppose you're going to want to sit up all night and talk now. He replied, no, good night, and returned to his room. He waited for her to fall asleep before returning to her room. He took a claw hammer and bludgeoned her before slitting her throat with a knife. Ed had finally conquered his mother and cut off her head. He put it on the shelf and screamed at it for an hour, threw darts at it, then smashed her face in. He cut out her tongue and larynx and put them in the garbage disposal. Unfortunately, the garbage disposal could not break down her tough vocal cords, and it ejected the tissue back into the sink. Ed later said that seemed appropriate, as much as she had screamed and yelled at him over so many years. He hid his mother's corpse in a closet and went out for a drink. When he returned home, he invited his mother's best friend, 59-year-old Sarah Taylor Sally Hallett, over for a dinner and a movie. As soon as she arrived, Ed strangled her to death, decapitated her, and spent the rest of the night with her body. He stuffed her corpse in a closet and tidied up the house, hiding any evidence of a disturbance. He then wrote a note for the police. Approximately 5.15 a.m. Saturday, he wrote, no need for her to suffer any more at the hands of this horrible, murderous butcher. It was quick, asleep, the way I wanted it. Not sloppy and incomplete, gents, just a lack of time. I got things to do. Ed Kemper got into his car and drove nonstop to Pueblo, Colorado. He listened to the radio for anything about the murders of his mother and Sally, but there was nothing. He found a phone booth and called the police, confessing to the murders of his mother and Sally, yet oddly the police did not take him seriously and told him to call back at a later time. He tried calling again hours later, asking to speak to an officer he personally knew. He confessed again and waited for the police to arrive and take him into custody, where he confessed to the murders of six students. Why did he turn himself in, though? Ed said the original purpose was gone. It wasn't serving any physical or real or emotional purpose. It was just a pure waste of time. Emotionally, I couldn't handle it much longer, he said. Towards the end there, I started feeling the folly of the whole thing, and to the point of near exhaustion, near collapse, I called it all off. Edmund Kemper was indicted on eight counts of first-degree murder on May 7, 1973. He was assigned a public defender, and thanks to his detailed confession, his only option was to plead not guilty by reason of insanity. Ed tried killing himself twice, but he survived, and his trial commenced October 23, 1973. He was examined by three court-appointed psychiatrists, who ultimately found him to be legally sane. One of his psychiatrists looked at his juvenile records and diagnosed that he was once psychotic. He also gave Ed truth serum, where Ed had allegedly revealed that he had engaged in cannibalism, claimed he sliced flesh from the legs of his victims and then cooked and consumed these strips of flesh in a casserole. Regardless, even this psychiatrist had determined that he had been fully cognizant in each case and enjoyed the prospect of the infamy associated with being labeled a murderer. Ed later recanted the confession of cannibalism. On November 1st, Ed took the stand, testifying that he had killed the victims because he wanted them, quote, for myself, like possessions, unquote. He continued to try and convince the jury that he was insane, 
based on the reasoning that his actions could only have been committed by someone with an aberrant mind. He said two beings inhabited his body, and then when the killer personality took over it was kind of like blacking out. Nevertheless, on November 8th, the jury made up of six men and six women declared him sane and guilty on all counts. Ed asked for the death penalty, even requesting death by torture. However, a moratorium had been placed on capital punishment by the Supreme Court at that time, so instead he received only seven years to life for each count and to be served concurrently at the California Medical Facility. He sat in the same prison block as Charles Manson and Herbert Mullen. He showed particular disdain for Herbert, saying that he was just a cold-blooded killer, killing everybody he saw for no good reason. Herbert stood five feet seven inches to Ed's six feet nine inches, making it easy for him to be intimidated. Ed once stated that Herbert had a habit of singing and bothering people when somebody tried to watch TV. So I threw water on him to shut him up. Then when he was a good boy, I'd give him peanuts. Herbie liked peanuts. That was effective because pretty soon he asked permission to sing. That's called behavior modification treatment. As a model prisoner, he was placed in charge of scheduling other inmates' appointments with psychiatrists. He made pottery and became a prolific reader of books on tape for the blind. He was retired from these positions in 2015 after suffering a stroke and declared medically disabled. He's participated in numerous interviews over the years, even helping the FBI understand the mind of serial killers. FBI profiler John Douglas described him as among the brightest prison inmates he ever interviewed and capable of rare insight for a violent criminal. Ed has stated that he's participated in the interviews to save others like himself from killing. There's somebody out there that's watching this and hasn't done that, hasn't killed people and wants to, and rages inside and struggles with that feeling, or is so sure they have it under control. They need to talk to somebody about it trust somebody enough to sit down and talk about something that isn't a crime. Thinking that way isn't a crime. Doing it isn't just a crime, it's a horrible thing. It doesn't know when to quit, and it can't be stopped easily once it starts. As for parole, Ed became eligible in 1979, but was denied then, and again in 1980, 1981, and 1982. He waived his right to a hearing in 1985, and at his hearing in 1988, he was once again denied. He said, society is not ready in any shape or form for me. I can't fault them for that. Denials again in 1991 and 1994, and he again waived his right to a hearing in 1997 and 2002. In 2007, he was again denied parole. Prosecutor Ariadna Simmons said, We don't care how much of a model prisoner he is because of the enormity of his crimes. In 2012, Ed waived his right to a hearing, and in 2016, attorney Scott Curry, who had represented him at his 2007 hearing, relayed a message to the media stating that Edmund Kemper believes no one's ever going to grant him parole and that he's happy going about his life in prison. He was again denied parole in 2017. Edmund Kemper will be eligible for parole again in 2024. He'll be 76. Up next, a weirdo family member shares her hair-raising incident with an invisible phantom's hand. But first, was Zygmunt Adamski really the victim of murderous extraterrestrial visitors? That story is up next when Weird Darkness returns. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, to visit sponsors you hear about during the show, sign up for my newsletter, enter contests, connect with me on social media, hear other podcasts that I host, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated. Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com.
On the 16th of June, 1980, on the Ilkley Moor near Todd Morden, a grisly scene emerged when a 56-year-old coal miner named Zygmunt Adamski was found dead. His body was discovered spread over the top of a mound of coal about 20 miles away from where he lived in Tingley. Adamski had been missing for five days. He had only popped out to grab some potatoes from the local supermarket and had not been seen since. Officials discovered a strange collection of burn marks to his head, neck, and shoulders. The strange marks also had been covered in some kind of ointment, but experts had no luck in figuring out what this material or cream was. He was wearing his trousers and jacket, but for some reason his shirt was missing. To police, it appeared that he'd been undressed and then dressed again in haste, as his trousers and shoes were not fastened properly and his coat was buttoned the wrong way. His face only showed about 24 hours' worth of beard growth, but he'd been missing for a full five days. His body also managed to have no coal specks on it, even though he was laying on top of a big pile of coal. Some officials believed that he was somehow lowered down onto the peak of the coal pile. The initial examination came to the conclusion that Adamski probably died from a heart attack, but a policeman, Alan Goddard, who first saw the body, pointed out that his lifeless face was frozen in complete fear. The coroner actually agreed with this statement and admitted that the dead man must have known great fear or pain. Officer Alan Goddard came forward six months later and claimed that he'd experienced some sort of UFO activity on the 28th of November, 1980. He stated that he was driving around a Todd Morton Council housing estate at just after 5 a.m., and suddenly he spotted a large, bright bus in the distance coming toward him. As the bus approached, he realized that what he thought was a bus was floating a few feet off the ground and it had some sort of spinning mechanism underneath it. The policeman stopped his car and tried his best to radio the incident in, but neither his car radio nor his walkie-talkie would work. He kept quiet on the subject until he had a conversation with a group of policemen in nearby Halifax, who had also had an encounter with this strange bus. A group of UFO researchers looked into Goddard's case and discovered he was actually missing about 15 minutes of time. They urged him to go under hypnosis to try and recover the lost memories, and he agreed. The hypnosis was able to recall that the policeman actually passed out when the bus got near him, and he woke up on a table with a six-foot figure dressed in black and white in the room with him. Journalist John Sheard, who witnessed the video of the hypnosis session, relayed Officer Goddard's words to the reader in an edition of the Sunday Mirror from September 1981. They're horrible, he said, small, three to four feet like five-year-old lads. There are eight of them. He's touching me. He's feeling at my clothes. They have hands and heads like a lamp. They keep touching me. They're making noises. Joseph, I know him as Joseph. He's told me not to be frightened. They are robots. They're not human. They're robots they're his. They are Joseph's robots. There's a bloody dog. It's horrible. The size of an Alsatian. Could it be that Zygmunt Adamski and Officer Alan Goddard did go through the same experience? But Adamski's age and poor heart just couldn't stand the terror of the incident? The following was submitted anonymously from one of our female weirdo family members. In 2009, my first child was a one-year-old, and my always shoulder-length hair was now short, a sort of pixie bob combo with longer bangs in the front and shorter hair in the back, but not spiky. This will be relevant in a bit. Since moving to the dwelling in 1996, my aunt's Oceanside, California house always had a spooky and eerie feeling in it, there was a darkness that could be felt throughout, although it was nothing you could quite put your finger on. As a guest, it was usually easy to ignore with the comfort of knowing others were in the house and I didn't live there, so frequent visits were not uncommon, despite the icy feeling enveloping you at the end of the hall, near the bathroom, as well as in the kitchen the opposite side of the hallway, especially at night. 
And speaking of night, her part of the street is poorly lit, making her house and several others very dark, all just adding to the chill factor. By 2009, the haunted ambience was all too familiar, but nothing to be of concern. The house had its odd character, but we'd all grown used to it. So visiting one day with my then one-year-old daughter wasn't anything out of the norm. As a recent stay-at-home mom and extra time, it was a fun getaway, a nice break from the mundane. As the early night settled in, my daughter was sleeping in a bassinet located in the living room. I took this freedom to start packing up the car. We had a good hour and a half trek back home. The layout is standard single-story mid-century, four-bedroom home, with an attached garage leading to the open-concept kitchen. If sitting in the living room, facing the front door, the kitchen is to the right and the creepy hallway leading to the bathroom and bedrooms to the left. My family was spread about the house either in their rooms or hanging in the garage, which was converted into a hangout. My car was in the driveway, and I was walking back and forth from the living room out the front door and to the driveway, positioned slightly to the right of the pathway. After several trips, I walked back outside towards the car to double-check that all was stored away, and I was truly ready to go before waking a sleeping baby. I was alone, walking swiftly, in the dimly lit outside, when it felt like a moth the size of a bat got caught in my hair and was flapping around. Instinctively, I ducked, shook my head, and swatted my arm around my head to scare the massive bug off. But this is Southern California, in a beach city. There were no bats or moths flapping freely in my hair, and nothing flew away. I was swatting at air. Continuing my path to the trunk of my car, I then felt something tug on my bangs, It was at this point the phantom hands shaking my hair and tugging my bangs freaked me out enough. I ran back into the house calling for my family. With absolute fear in my soul, I explained that it felt like somebody had taken their fingers and tossed my short hair as I was walking to the car and when I stopped at the trunk. I felt a tug on my bangs. That was it. I was out of there. There was no way it was a bug, bird, human. I was completely alone. In all my years of experiencing paranormal activity, this phenomenon was by far the scariest occurrence. All the way home, I prayed and apologized for ever doubting. As far as my aunt's house goes, it's still creepy. They continue to experience odd occurrences, and I have since visited on numerous occasions. Thankfully, nothing has ever laid its invisible hands on me nor any of my family since. Thanks for listening. If you like the podcast and you haven't already subscribed, be sure to do so now so you don't miss future episodes. And also, please, tell someone else about the podcast. Recommend Weird Darkness to your friends, family, and co-workers who love the paranormal, horror stories, or true crime like you do. Every time you share the podcast with someone new, it helps spread the word about the show, and a growing audience makes it possible for me to keep creating episodes as often as I do. All stories in Weird Darkness are purported to be true unless stated otherwise, and you can find source links or links to the authors in the show notes. Kemper is from the Scare Chamber. The Zygmunt Adamski extraterrestrial incident is from real paranormal experiences, and hair-raising experience was submitted anonymously by a weirdo family member. And now that we're coming out of the dark, I'll leave you with a little light. Isaiah 40, verse 29. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. And a final thought, believe for the good, lest you drown in the bad. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me in the weird darkness.